Does creatine supplementation cause baldness or hair loss? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and welcome to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional misinformation online. In this video, we're going to get into the creatinine, no, creatine idea again. Remember, creatinine is a blood level that you check that has to do with kidney function. Creatine or creatine is a supplement that a lot of people are using for muscular and performance enhancement. Dr. Brad Stanfield, I've reviewed Dr. a lot of Dr. Brad's videos before. I like the style, the evidence-based nature of his content. Not always agreeing with him about keto and low-carb diets, but that's okay. And let's see what Dr. Brad has to say about creatine. Before I dive into this video, I want to invite you to a free two-part carnivore workshop with me on January 17th and 19th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. If you've tried keto or elimination diets and still feel stuck, I'll explain why carnivore works when other approaches fail and whether it might be right for you. Register today and we'll send you the Zoom link for both live sessions. Sign up by clicking the link below. There's a lot of confusion and distrust over creatine supplementation, particularly around hair loss, uric acid, bloating, and weight gain. So did I make a mistake in my video last week where I explained that the human clinical research suggests that most people should take creatine supplements? Is creatine actually safe? Starting with hair loss. These concerns were raised after a 2009 study of college-aged rugby players. What they found is that dihydrotestosterone levels, they were increased by about 56% with creatine supplements compared to placebo, and this is a problem because dihydrotestosterone, it often causes male patterned baldness. Which brings us to a new study that was published last year 2021. It states that the results of that original 2009 study that raised the concerns about dihydrotestosterone levels, those results have not been replicated. And we also know that resistance training itself can raise testosterone and dihydrotestosterone levels. That's a lot of information, isn't it? Well, the idea that a supplement can raise the likelihood of male pattern baldness has to do with the the pathways and the testosterone, the DHT, the, the intermediaries there. And in that study that was done, you know, they didn't really see the baldness, right? So it, it's a study that looked at the intermediate marker that in the blood that often goes along with or, or causes the baldness. We see studies like this all the time where there's a short period of time where there are surrogate or intermediate markers of you know, heart disease, stroke, baldness. And because there are changes in that direction, then the, the scientists sign off and say, see, it's bad for you because you're going down that pathway. But you haven't really seen the outcome that they're talking about. So a, a really good point here is that you always want to find a replication of a study that's kind of novel and unusual. The idea that science is replicable. No. The hallmark of science is replication. So what takes science away from religion and beliefs, you can believe something to be true, but if you haven't seen it and replicated it over and over and over, that's really not science. So a review paper saying that nobody has replicated that kind of has question on the validity of the work. Of course, nobody may have ever tried to replicate it. On the other hand, things like really remarkable things in science sometimes get newsworthy, but then nobody can replicate it. So it gets, you know, the political death of nobody will talk about it again. So always look for replication of a study, an important point here. It's also important to remember that it's the free testosterone that gets converted into dihydrotestosterone. And in that 2009 study, there were no increases in total testosterone and free testosterone, it was not measured. We also know that before that 2009 study started, the dihydrotestosterone levels in the creatine group, they were 23% lower compared to the placebo group. Therefore, the small increase in dihydrotestosterone levels in the creatine group, combined with the small decrease in dihydrotestosterone levels in the placebo group, 
group. Those two things explain the statistically significant increase that this paper observed. Overall, it was a flaw in how that 2009 data was interpreted. Plus, to date, we've got 12 separate studies that have looked at creatine supplements and its effects on testosterone. And while two studies reported small, insignificant increases in total testosterone, 10 studies reported no change in testosterone. And in five of those studies, free testosterone, which is the testosterone that gets converted into dihydrotestosterone, there was no difference seen. In summary then, the current body of evidence does not indicate that creatine supplementation increases total testosterone, free testosterone, DHT, or causes hair loss. Instead, we know that testosterone levels increase after resistance training. So it's far more likely that creatine supplements are getting blamed for baldness when actually it's because of the resistance training and just that people are getting older. So stick around until the end of the video because I'll go through how to treat male patterned baldness. Yeah, so that's called a confounder. When you have two things going on at the same time, but you blame the one that you're you know, prejudging or, or blaming. So people who are exercising like this are taking the creatine and so that it's really the exercise, not the creatine. So that could be figured out by doing other studies where you separate with placebo control whether there's the change in testosterone. I'd, I sure like to see a study that showed actually people getting the baldness, the outcome, rather than just look at these intermediate markers or surrogate markers. And yet we see that all the time, especially in the cholesterol world, where you might take a drug and it changes the cholesterol level, but it doesn't change an outcome. Remember, cholesterol is not a disease. So the change in testosterone is not a disease. What they're talking about here is baldness and hair loss, and that really wasn't happening when the research was looked at over and over. Although I have to say, when Dr. Brad says that some studies show this, some studies show that, so therefore it doesn't apply or doesn't show it, I, I've become a little more, how should I say, cautious in that if some studies show it, some don't, that means there may be differences in people. And so you can always get these items, these blood levels or outcomes measured now. And so there, if there's controversy or, or just disagreement in measurements and studies, you can always get it measured in yourself to see if that research or the change applies to you. So before throwing out, oh, look, there's no change, if you think that that might be happening, you can always measure the things yourself. And that applies to even cholesterol levels or testosterone levels. You can get those checked pretty easily now. Moving on to uric acid. Now we worry about uric acid because if the levels are too high, that can cause gout. And there was a comment in my previous video where creatine supplements were being blamed for causing a gout flare. But we know from human studies that creatine supplementation, it actually decreases uric acid. Once again, creatine supplements are the innocent bystander getting blamed. So is creatine actually safe? Well, it's been used heavily since the 1990s and over 1,000 studies have been conducted and billions of servings of creatine have been ingested. The only consistent reported side effect of creatine supplements is weight gain and this makes sense. Creatine helps our muscles work harder, for longer and recover quicker and therefore help us build muscle. We're increasing our lean body mass. Now crucially, it does not increase fat mass. What we also know is that from available short-term and long-term studies in healthy and diseased people, from infants to elderly, with studies lasting up to five years, they consistently show that creatine supplementation poses no adverse health risks. There have been many unsubstantiated claims about creatine, but in well-conducted studies we've got proof that creatine supplementation it does not increase the risk of injury, dehydration, muscle cramping, or gastrointestinal upset. The final safety aspect of creatine supplements I want to go through is kidney health. Long-term, high-dose creatine supplements have not been associated with an increase in kidney dysfunction. While some people, myself included, suggest that people with pre-existing kidney disease should consult with their physician prior to creatine supplementation in an abundance of caution, there are many studies suggesting that there's no compelling evidence that creatine supplementation negatively affects kidney function in healthy or diseased populations. But while that's what the evidence suggests, I certainly recommend checking with your doctor first. <laughs> right. So, a good, safe way to end it. The research, of course, is heavily biased toward otherwise healthy people. 
And while there are a few studies looking at creatine supplementation with cognitive function and sarcopenia, I, I like the idea of you know making sure your doctor is aware that you're taking the supplement if you are and learn about how to take it. There's a loading phase and then a daily phase. And then remember that you're getting creatine from the food that you eat. If you've changed to a higher protein, low carb or keto carnivore type of diet, you're probably getting the amount of creatine in your food or, or more in your food than actually in that supplement that you might be, be taking. So does more of it really mean better? That's another common sort of theme out there. If it's good, then more of it must be even better when there might be a threshold at which that it is no longer helpful or might even be detrimental. You know, the, the world today uh, is, you know, focused on what can I take to improve, you know, my muscle function and my performance. When a lot of what I see, the improvements in people's health is by taking away things that are bad. Do you have to always take supplementation? No, I don't think so. And so in the context of the clinical setting where you're doing all these other things, you're, you're, you're losing weight and all that, no, you don't have to add creatine. If you're concerned about the sarcopenia and loss of muscle mass, you want to be exercising, doing resistance and aerobic training while you're losing the weight. Although most people come to me, they just can't exercise at first. We pause and say, first, let me help you lose the weight. Yeah, you don't really need exercise to lose the weight. And we will maintain the muscle mass by giving your body plenty of protein so that it can not lose muscle mass while you're losing the fat mass or reversing the diabetes. Once you're at your, your weight maintenance goal, then I change my tune a little bit. I'll talk about exercising and, and making sure that you're getting plenty of protein, which includes creatine and the protein that you eat. Or maybe you want to add the supplementation. I'm not quite sure about that yet, but you might want to. So I, I thanks to Brad, Dr. Brad, for doing these videos with the papers that I saw these papers. It's just hard for me to display them to you. And I agree with the caution that you want to be following with a doctor, telling your doctor, if you have elevated creatinine, be sure to, to tell your doctor you're taking creatine supplementation. I hope you find this helpful. If you like, please like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell. Look for new content on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, consider joining our YouTube membership for early access and exclusive live Q&As with me. Just click the join button below or support us with a PayPal in the description.